Hi everybody. This lecture is going to be about the difference between propositions and non-propositions in logic. <clears throat> so let's start out by defining what a proposition is. So a proposition in logic is merely a sentence that's true or false. A declarative statement that's true or false. If you're not taking notes right now, you should be. Okay, so propositions, it's pretty simple. Just a sentence that's true or false. So for example, I am a man. That is a proposition. That's a true proposition. Here's another one. I am a woman. That is a false proposition. But it's still a proposition, even though it's false. Another true proposition. Um, plants manufacture oxygen in photosynthesis. Another false proposition. Um, the moon is made of green cheese. Those are all examples of propositions. Propositions in logic are also called statements. So if you hear people using the word proposition or the word statement, they mean the same thing. What is that thing again that a proposition or a statement is? It's merely a true or false sentence. And arguments are composed of propositions true or false statements. It would be impossible to figure out whether an argument is true or false overall uh, if we were unable to determine the truth or falsity of its component parts. So, um, so again, arguments must contain propositions. And arguments contain two types of propositions. One is a premise. And the other is the conclusion. So again, arguments are made of propositions or statements. Statements or propositions are sentences that are true or false. Now, the premise, you probably already know, the premise is the reason, or if it's multiple, are the reasons that you have for a specific conclusion. So the conclusion of your argument is what you're trying to support or prove. So conclusions are, can often be stated, um, or issues can often be stated as questions. For example, is it ethically uh, acceptable to cheat? Right? And then the answer to that issue question would be the conclusion of your argument. If you think it's not ethically acceptable to cheat, then your conclusion would be, it is not ethically acceptable to, to cheat. And then the premises would be uh, the reasons why your conclusion is true. Or let's just say your conclusion follows. So conclusions follow from premises. Sometimes they follow necessarily. Other times conclusions are supported by the premises depending on the types of arguments. But we want our arguments to be composed of these true or false uh, statements, these propositions. Now you might be thinking to yourself, <clears throat> aren't all st sentences true or false? Isn't everything a proposition? And that question in itself, we can actually determine whether or not that's a proposition. But you might be surprised to find out that not everything is a proposition. In this course, we're going to focus primarily on three categories. And we'll call these non-propositions. I'm going to make a genus species diagram here. So everything that falls within these two little angled lines is going to be an example of a non-proposition. And again, there are three that we're going to focus on in this course. The first example of a non-proposition is a question. I'll actually end up talking about four types of propositions, or four types of uh, sentences in our language that are non-propositions. But three of them are, are, pretty, are the ones that we'll go over primarily. So questions. The second are exclamations. And the third <clears throat> are commands. So questions, exclamations, and commands are all examples of propositions, or non-propositions, excuse me. Um, maybe you can come up with a little thing like, 
quizzes examine, I don't know, cauliflower. Anyway, try to use a little mnemonic device with QEC um, uh, so that you can remember questions, exclamations, and commands. This one's kind of hard to do because there aren't a lot of keywords. <clears throat> but maybe you could just say questions engage commoners or something. Um, and then you can think about this. But anyway, these three examples are things that are non-propositions. And now let's think about that. What we're saying here is that a question, an exclamation, or a command are <clears throat> sentences that are neither true nor false. Um, and so let's think about that. Let's start with number one, questions. So if I ask all of you, how are you? And you examine this sentence in itself. Can you determine whether or not this is true or false? Just think about it. For, is this true? How are you? Is it false? How are you? Right now your mind might be like, kind of like short circuiting a little bit, right? Um, and that's precisely because this sentence is neither true nor false. Now you might be saying to yourself, well, but Justin, you just said, you just asked me, Justin just asked me, how are you? And that's true. You just asked me, how are you? Is it how are you or is it how are you? Ooh. Okay, but anyway, so Justin asked me, <clears throat> how are you? Now, is this different from this? Yes, it is, right? This is an absolutely different sentence. The sentence, Justin asked me, how are you, is different from how are you. When questions stand alone by themselves, there is no truth value. However, when you reformulate questions into declarative statements like Justin asked me, how are you, then now this is actually a proposition because this is true. I just asked you, how are you? Right? So actually what we've done here is we've turned the question into a proposition. And so you must think of questions alone without any other qualifiers or qualities. So how are you has no truth value, so it is a non-proposition. In any question, try to think of a question that you know is true or false. What time is it? If somebody asks you what time is it and we just look at that sentence, we can't determine whether or not that's true or false. It's, it's absurd to think of it as having a truth value. Now, we know that the statement, Justin asked me what time is it, well, that, that would be true if I asked you what time it was. And we know that people want an answer. So for example, when Justin asked me what time it is it, he wants me to tell him the time. Again, that would be another proposition. But questions in themselves are not propositions. Let's look at the second example, two. Exclamations. Maybe I'll just add a exclamation point. Exclamations, right? So whenever anyone says something like, wow, or ouch, or great, those are not true or false. If I'm like, wow, right? I'm expressing my wonder at something. But that statement in itself is neither true nor false. Now, one way to, to see this is just that these are just singular sentences and, or singular words, and, and they're not really complete sentences. So they don't express a full thought that we can actually an analyze for its truth value either. Um, but just remember that exclamations in themselves are non-propositions as well. And the final group is commands. So, for example, if I say, shut the door, or, <clears throat> let me rewrite that. If I say to you, shut the door, that statement in itself is neither true nor false. I'm giving you a command to do something. Now, if you say, Justin, you just told me to shut the door, that would actually be a proposition. Justin just told me to shut the door. But the command by itself is not a proposition. Clean the clothes. 
iron the shirts. Dunk grandma, dunk grandma's head under the water, just as a joke, right? Um, all of those things are commands and are neither true nor false, and hence non-propositions. So these are the three groups um, <clears throat> that are non-propositions. Now there's a fourth group, and it's really kind of more of a, a type. Um, well, I guess groups are types, but one thing that we need to say here is that sentences must be well-formed. They must be woofs. If I, um, if I say a sentence that's not well formed using the grammatical context that is recognized by our culture or the language that we all speak, uh, it's really not a proposition. And Noam Chomsky gives examples of, or I, I believe it was Noam Chomsky who discovered, discovered, who first talked about this. But if I say, um, <clears throat> the desk breathes yellow. It's technically a sentence, right? Um, it has a verb and a subject, uh, but it doesn't make any sense for a desk to breathe yellow. There would be no way um, for you to identify whether or not that statement is true or false. So the, the sentences must abide by the grammatical context uh, of the language in which you find yourself, and for all of us, it's English. And so, but that also relates in terms of if a, if a, a sentence is ill-formed and it doesn't make any sense grammatically, um, then it's not fair to require somebody to be able to evaluate it. So our sentences need to have the correct grammatical structure, but they also can't say things that are, they just don't make any sense, like a desk breathing yellow or, um, or something of that nature. So just remember that uh, our propositions need to be such that the structure is noticeable and recognizable by those viewing the... Oops. Okay. So, but what does that mean? If arguments are made of propositions and questions, exclamations, and commands are not propositions, and we need our premises to be propositions and our conclusions to be propositions, then logically, what follows about questions, exclamations, and commands? Correct. You shouldn't use them as parts of your argument. Now, of course, you can ask rhetorical questions, you know, um, as a rhetorical technique. You can exclaim things in very loud and verbose language. You can um, command people to believe things, right? You know, so like, um, you ought to believe that Snickers bar should be illegal. I command you. You know, you can say like, it is now an order of the law that you ought to do this, right? Uh, but that, that doesn't um, force you logically in any sense to believe that Snickers bars ought to be uh, illegal. But what do we often do when we're creating our arguments? Well... I've seen a lot of students use questions as if they are premises. So let's say I'm trying to support the claim that God exists. Right? So let's say that my conclusion is that God exists. Um, and then I see a premise that says something like, if God didn't exist, where did the universe come from? Now, there are a lot of working assumptions, presuppositions in this statement, but notice that this is a question. So there's no way for me to tell if this is a true or false statement. Um, so if you say God exists, and that's your conclusion, and then you ask me, well, if God didn't exist, where did the universe come from? That uh, it's kind of a red herring. It takes you down a wrong path, right? Um, it takes us away from what you ought to be doing. Uh, it's also misplacing the burden of proof. If you're trying to prove that God exists, then the burden of proof rests on you to provide reasons why I ought to believe that God exists. And by the way, you don't know anything about whether or not I believe that God exists, right? I might believe that God does or doesn't. I don't want anybody to take offense. Um, but one thing about this course and about critical thinking in general 
is that we need to be able to take on multiple perspe perspectives and be objective about it, right? Uh, often, when it comes to things like this, it's extremely difficult for people to be objective about the other side, right? Um, so you often hear things like, oh, those crazy uh, religious people, they're, they're crazy and they believe in all these superstitions and all this brouhaha and nonsense, and they don't have any logical reasons for what they believe. Um, which is true, obviously, in some instances. But then on the opposite side, you hear people say, oh, those crazy atheists, um, they don't believe in God, they're going to go to hell. You know, I hope, you know, they realize it's going to be really hot where they're headed. Ha, ha, ha. Um, stuff like that. People, they, it's really hard for them to think objectively about the strengths and weaknesses of both positions. But in any case, if you're telling me that God exists, then the burden of proof rests on you to prove that God exists. It doesn't rest on me to tell you where the universe came from. In fact, this might have nothing to do with God's existence at all. Um, it could be the case that God does not exist and the universe does exist. Uh, it could be the case that God exists and that our universe exists. It could be right now that we just think the universe exists and it really doesn't, that God actually exists and God is just thinking everything right now and just implanting things in me, right? Um, and then there's the whole question of what, is, what does it mean to exist, right? Um, the universe obviously came from somewhere. If it exists, it seems to exist in a material reality that we can analyze and things of that nature. But anyway, the whole point of this is to show that we shouldn't use questions to support our claims. Now, of course, you can claim, you can turn questions into propositions or claims or statements. So, for example, here, you could say um, <clears throat> the universe... could not have emerged from nothing. Kind of do the whole Aquinas, there must be uh, a cause uh, uh, to everything. For example, my, my parents caused me, right? They uh, got together and they were like, hey, what's up, what's up? And then they, uh, you know, came together and then uh, they they caused my existence right I, I came out of my mother and then um, my parents were caused by their parents and so on and so on and so on back 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 so um, everything has a cause therefore there must be a necessary cause uh, because you can't go back forever there must be some cause at the very beginning right and that's kind of the way that you're that you would be thinking here along uh, with the lens of or through the lens of Aquinas or in a similar vein um, but anyway, this is actually something that is either true or false. Now, this is going to be an extremely um, difficult claim to prove either to be true or false. So just because a claim is difficult to, to prove um, or to analyze to determine whether or not it's true or false doesn't mean that it's not true or false. For example, this claim, God exists. Let's drop this for a little bit. Now, this statement... Again, remember, statement means proposition. Statement and proposition are equal to a true or false sentence. This statement is true or false. Does anybody know the actual truth or falsity of this statement? No. Um, now, of course, we, can, we all make inferences based on our experiences and things of that nature. Um, and people say, well, I know that God exists, right? Um, but... Again, let's, let's play this like back and forth, kind of the, the style that we need to think of when we're doing logic and when we're thinking about arguments. How, do, how would somebody respond to say to you, let's say, if you say, I know God exists? Well, I can just easily imagine somebody saying, well, oh, how do you know? I know it because I had this experience where um, I was going to die, and then I felt this presence, and then I was miraculously healed. Okay, well, couldn't that just be, uh, the, I don't know, you got high or perhaps like your immune system just reacted in this really rapid way and healed you? Well, it could be, but I know that, I just know God exists, right? And we kind of keep going back and forth and back and forth. And in addition to that, of course, um, and again, I'm not like belittling either side, but if you believe that God exists, then the person who doesn't believe that can just say, God, God, right? Um, and it, it appears that if God does exist, that God has left us kind of in some kind of world where we are alone or where, where we're distanced, right? Um, 
and we we hear about supernatural occurrences and all these things, but um, it doesn't appear that there are you know YouTube videos of people's legs growing back or something or um, these kind of supernatural occurrences seem always like happen right in Africa, right? <laughs> like, um, oh well, yeah, it happened back in the jungle and and this guy died and then he came back to life and things like that. Um, but, you know, most of us would require some sort of empirical evidence to actually claim that this claim is true. Um, now, it might be the case that, that this claim is true, but it doesn't seem like we live in a world in which we can know the answer to this question, for, like, absolutely, uh, until after death. But even then, we might not be able to know, because if God does not exist, in fact, it's more than likely that when we die, it's lights out, right? It's Lucretius. It's returning back to the nothingness from whence we came. So most of us um, don't remember when we were one year old or when we were born or um, maybe two years old. Some of us don't even have any memories till we're seven, eight, maybe even later in life, right? Um, and nobody's upset that they don't remember the darkness that they were. I mean, they were walking around, right? Like, I was like, Mama, you know, like, I, I'm a baby. I have a belly button, you know? Um, but I don't remember any of that. I was obviously a, a rational being who was existing and experiencing the world. I kind of emerged out of that darkness, and I remember when I emerged out of the darkness, my first memory, um, I stepped on a bee when I was probably about four years old. And I remember that bee, uh, like in my memory, it's like this huge, like a, like a pig flying around, like, you know. And it stung me, and I didn't, I had never experienced uh, such a sensation in my life. And, my consciousness emerged in that moment. I start to remember who I was. Uh, and from then on, I kind of have these sporadic memories. For Lucretius and, and others, we just return back to the nothingness, right? And in fact, if God does not exist, it's more, li more than likely that when we die, our consciousness shuts off, you know, because it's probably just human consciousness is just the result of material interactions. Um, and maybe some non-material interactions, maybe ones that we don't understand fully. Um, but more than likely, and in that case, if God doesn't exist, there's no way to know that God didn't exist, right? Because when you die, if you return back into infinite nothingness, there will be no consciousness. It won't be like you thinking about a big, dark, black space. Instead, it'll just be like, like lights out, like a dark, dreamless sleep. Have you ever gone to sleep? You go to sleep, and your mind just shuts off. You wake up. It seems like you've been asleep for like three minutes. You know, you're like, <gasps> it's been like nine hours. There was nothing, right? Um, it would be something like that. But anyway, I, I know I'm like seemingly digressing, and you'll get used to it. But um, we can't use questions to support our claims, right? We need to use true or false sentences. So think about all the times where you've asked your reader in your papers, like, um, you know, well, if you don't think that this is wrong, what would the world be like if it weren't? Well, a good technique in writing is to always answer your own rhetorical questions. If you're going to ask me what the world would be like if, if this were not wrong, then please explain it to me. Tell me your own perspective on what you believe the world would be like. Don't wait for me to respond in my mind and then try to respond to my response. And the best thing is probably just to not use rhetorical questions at all. But also notice the input, you know, exclamations, that's kind of like we get it. Like you wouldn't be like, God exists. Wow. Right, I mean, most people would not, would recognize that that's an insufficient premise, right? You know how I know God exists? Wow! <laughs> you know, like, uh, yeah, it doesn't make sense. Um, but let's talk about commands, you know. And some of us, especially in relation to this issue, have had experiences where somebody has commanded us to believe this, right? You know, it's like, why should I... Uh, why should I um, believe that God exists? One question that people might say, do you want to go to hell? And our minds automatically create an argument, right? So the question itself doesn't really support the claim because it's neither true nor false. But our minds create an argument, right? If you don't believe in God, um, then there'll be a punishment. If, the, if there's a punishment, then it'll be hell. Therefore, if I don't believe in God, then I'll, I'll go to hell. But some of the other people have forced us to believe things by saying, you have to believe in God. You have to believe in God. You just have to. You have to have faith. You have to have hope. You have to have whatever it might be, right? And on the opposite side, perhaps people have had parents or people that they look up to have said, 
God doesn't exist. Uh, you don't believe that crap, do you? Again, a question, right? Uh, or they might say, you can't believe that. Don't believe that. Don't believe that lie, right? Or something like of that nature. And so you can see how people manipulate their arguments by using uh, non-propositions. So when people start asking you rhetorical questions, uh, again, the whole goal here is to start thinking about how we can apply this in our lives, right? Well, now you know that when somebody presents an argument to you and a conclusion, they need to have good reasons for that, for you to believe it. And of course, there are good reasons. I believe there are good reasons to believe that God exists. I also believe that there are very good reasons to believe that God doesn't exist. And that's why these questions continue to stimulate debate and uh, healthy and relevant debate, uh, not merely people screaming at each other. Um, and uh, with a lot of these issues that we'll be covering in this course, big questions in philosophy, uh, there are good reasons to believe uh, different positions. Now, people disagree, of course, and they might think that the other reasons are not good reasons. But if we all kind of stand back and try to be objective about it, I think that the, the people can pre present strong arguments that don't rely on rhetoric and manipulation. Um, and that's what we're going to do in this course. So if people are questioning you to try and get you to try and support their positions, if they're exclaiming or if they are commanding, those are not good reasons to believe anything. Now, I know we have a lot of military students. It's a bit different in the military, right? If somebody gives you a command, then especially if they're your superior, you have to do it. Now, they might not give you any good reasons for doing what they command you to do, but within that contractual framework, you must do uh, what they tell you. Now, of course, there have been instances in all cultures where people have not obeyed uh, military commands, and there are usually um, punishments for, for doing so. There are times where people have not obeyed military commands when they should have. Uh, there are times when people have not obeyed military commands when they shouldn't have, and they did the right thing by not obeying um, those military commands. I'm not telling you, as a military student, when your your officer tells you, hey, you know, your patrol starts, uh, and I don't know if this is actually what they say, but your patrol is going to start in four hours. I expect you to be at the northwest corner of the... Uh, 15 minutes early and get up in your post and you're going to be, you know, um, a lookout for like the next eight hours. I don't expect you to say, hey, you know, like, can you give me some reasons why I should, because all you're doing right now is like commanding me to, to do it. I mean, that's not a smart move. It's also not very smart if your boss is like commanding everybody and like pretending like it's an argument to call out your boss and say, uh, excuse me, you've just been asking us rhetorical questions and giving us commands. There's no logical reason why I ought to do what you're telling me to do. Could you provide some propositions that support, you know, again, that's not a smart move. But what you can do is you can do it in your head and you can think about arguments and the way that people use these techniques to get you to believe what they want you to believe, right? And I'm not trying to be a conspiracy theorist, although I do believe that a lot of these techniques, right, Think of commercials, right? Are you sick and tired of being fat? Are you sick and tired of people not liking you? Are you sick and tired of this? Buy the Nutribullet or whatever, right? Buy this product and people will like you. Buy this car, right? So actually that's kind of a, it's, it acts as an argument, really. But really what it is is a question and a command, right? Are you sick of not being liked by people? Buy this. And then it's a very effective technique, although it gives us no logical reason to believe that we ought to do what they're telling us to do. So anyway, um, that's uh, a little analysis of propositions. So what we talked about what propositions are. Remember, propositions are statements. Those are true or false sentences. We talked about the three classes of things in general um, that are non-propositions, questions, exclamations, and commands. We talked about the fact that propositions have to be well-formed sentences. They need to abide by the grammar uh, and the logic of the language that you're using to speak. And then we talked a lot about uh, um, arguments, premises, and conclusions, and we talked about ways that people use manipulation to get, uh, not manipulation per se, but they use these non-propositions to, to support a definite proposition um, and hopefully you'll now be able to see that and also don't do it yourself right um, you know sometimes it's a lot easier to say 
you know, why, why should I do it? Because I said so, right? Or do it now to your kids. But, you know, kids are pretty smart. And if you explain to them that going to bed is important because if they don't go to bed, then they're going to not function well the following day or they're not going to do well at school or they need to learn how to go to bed so that they, in the future, you know, they can wake up in time for work or whatever. Now, of course, I'm collapsing everything into this, like, kind of, you work hard and all this stuff, and that's how you, whatever. But anyway, explaining to kids, I think, you can start to use actual argumentation, and, you know, of course, at some point, you're going to have to command, and you're going to have to do those things. But I think sometimes we don't give kids enough credit, and we kind of immediately go to the command instead of presenting, like, a, a well-reasoned argument um, that at least your, your child will can say, well, you know, I've seen a lot of changes in you since you've been taking this logic class, you know, so good work, Mom. I'm still not going to go to bed, but I think you made a good argument, right? So anyway, um, I hope you keep watching these lecture videos, and uh, next we will move on to, uh, to, we'll build on our knowledge of arguments uh, further. Thanks for watching.